Ethan, what would you say to your victims? Ethan Couch got Ethan Couch had Ethan, Ethan Couch. North Texas most infamous juvenile offender walks free. Families forever changed by a teenager's decision to drive drunk. Look at my brother. He's doing more than 10 years in, on probation. But I think that was the trigger that sent him running. The manhunt and debate over affluenza captured the nation. Years later, the question of race. I guess they don't have affluenza. They may have poor affluenza. Privilege and forgiveness. I've seen a, a change in Ethan. Now louder than ever before. Live from Victory Park, News 8 at 6 starts now. And right now, Ethan Couch's first night out of jail inside his father's sprawling home in northwest Fort Worth. Thank you for joining us for a special edition of News 8 on the release of Ethan Couch. He's a free man tonight after two years behind bars. Right now, Cynthia Seguire is inside our Dallas newsroom for a conversation that you do not want to miss. But first... News 8's Lauren Zakalik is live in Fort Worth with more on Ethan Couch's new reality. Yeah, good evening, John. That reality started at 11.30 this morning when Couch walked out of the probation office and into a swarm of questions about whether he feels remorse for what he did. Ethan, do you have anything to say to the families of your victims? It is the question so many have wondered for the past five years. But even on this day, the day Ethan Couch was released after two years in jail, he still didn't answer it. Ethan, do you have anything to say to the families of your victims? Ethan continues to be remorseful, as he has been from the first day of this tragic event. Couch, the so-called affluenza teen, said to be too spoiled to know right from wrong, went directly from the Tarrant County Probation Office into a black Tesla. The Tesla then carried him to his father's sprawling northwest Tarrant County home, where he'll spend all his time until Judge Wayne Salvant says otherwise. Couch was 16 back in 2013 when he drunkenly plowed his truck into a group of people, killing four and injuring others. Former prosecutor Richard Alpert will never forget the victims he fought for in court. Holly, Shelby, Brianna, Brian. But after receiving 10 years probation for the crimes, <laughs> video surfaced of Couch at a drinking party. Couch and his mother Tanya then fled to Mexico. That is what landed Couch behind bars for the past two years. Ethan Couch is the catchword for, you know, someone that dodges responsibility. And I'm hoping at the end of the story, the lesson's going to be that there is a price to pay. While many are skeptical of Couch's behavior, some, including those who lost loved ones, hope he's reformed. Kevin McConnell's son Lucas was injured in the wreck, and his close friend, Pastor Brian Jennings, was killed. You know, I think he deserves a chance to, to prove himself and try to right the ship and, and make a man of himself. Ethan, is there anything you would say to those families? And with a lack of words from Couch himself, It'll be his actions people are watching to see if he turns his life around. You know, Lauren, we know that Couch's freedom does come with some, some strict rules. So what happens if he actually violates his probation this time? Well, John, what happens is truly up to Judge Wayne Salvan, who, by the way, is the same judge for Tanya Couch's case. That's Ethan's mother. Up on your screen right now, you're going to see some of the parameters that Ethan is facing in his probation. Those conditions include GPS ankle monitoring, being confined to a home between 9 p.m. and 8 a.m., regular alcohol drug tests with urine and blood samples, and an ignition interlock device with camera monitoring in the car he's driving. If there's any reason to believe that Ethan violated these conditions, he will be brought to the courtroom where the judge will hear evidence of that. He can then impose new punishments, which include or could include up to 40 years in prison. That's 10 years for each victim. Back to you, John. All right, thanks a lot. Lauren Zakalik reporting for us tonight from Fort Worth. It's important to note that uh, Ethan Couch spent six months in jail for each of the four people who died as a result of his action. And we don't want their stories to get lost in our coverage tonight. Holly Boyles was a stay-at-home mom and a cancer survivor. Her daughter Shelby was a college senior studying to be a nurse. Brianna Mitchell loved cooking. On the night she was killed, she was heading home from a catering event. And then Brian Jennings was a beloved youth pastor. He left behind a wife and three children. For five years now, each development in this case has been a punch in the gut for those families, all of it layered with the question of privilege and the issue of parental neglect. The word affluenza grabbed the attention of the nation. Vegetic Miller, the psychologist who said it, wishes he could take it back. 
It's not a diagnosis. It's, uh, the diagnosis was something completely different. We talked to Miller in 2013. He figures he spent 50 hours with Ethan Couch and his parents before testifying in the case. Well, I, I think that term affluenza, which I was just using to describe what we used to call spoiled brat. The dictionary defines affluenza as a psychological malaise supposedly affecting wealthy young people, symptoms of which include a lack of motivation, feelings of guilt, and a sense of isolation. And over the last 15 years, research runs deep. A groundbreaking study out of Columbia University compared more than 200 mostly white suburban teenagers with the same number of mostly black urban high schoolers. The study showed the affluent teens drank and used drugs more than their low-income counterparts. So we know this case was about wealth, but was it also about race? We want to know what you think. Grab your phone, go to the Vote Now tile, the WFAA app, or WFAA.com slash Vote Now. Did race play a role in Ethan Couch's sentence? The results in just a moment. But first, Teresa Woodard takes a closer look. That is a broken justice system. When Omar Jawa thinks of Ethan Couch, he thinks color and class. If Ethan was named Omar, <laughs> um, we would be talking about the news story would say, judge appropriately gives, and you can go from there. Jawa works with at risk teens in inner city Dallas neighborhoods, where he says black youth and poor youth go to prison for far longer, over far less. Eric Miller is an example. Judge Gene Boyd, who sentenced Couch to probation, sentenced Miller to 20 years in prison for driving drunk and killing one person. I kept telling us, don't worry, Eric's going to get probation. Don't worry about it. While Miller was raised in poverty by his grandfather and had a court appointed lawyer, Ethan, what would you say to your victims? Couch's attorneys were named Texas super lawyers. Excuse me. There has to be justice that's not linked directly to dollars. Federal data backs up the frustrating reality Jawa sees every day. A 2017 study says black men receive 19 percent longer sentences than white men convicted of the very same crime. I guess they don't have affluenza, they may have poor fluenza, maybe we can go the other route. He believes justice is biased, not blind. Teresa Woodard, Channel 8 News. All right, so earlier we asked, did race play a role in Ethan Couch's sentence? You have been voting, past more than 500 of you voting so far right now. 75% of you telling us tonight, yes, 76% saying, yes, you do believe that it did play a role, and no, 24%. We do thank you for voting tonight. All right, so I had the power of forgiveness. Meet the man who has been visiting Ethan Couch and why he says he was able to let go of anger even after losing his best friend. And then Cynthia is in our Dallas newsroom where Ethan's release is hitting close to home for two very brave women. And then as we go to break, one more look at the faces, four lives taken too soon. Our special coverage of the Ethan Couch case continues when we come back. A time all but stopped for Sergio Molina when he was thrown from Ethan Couch's pickup truck and paralyzed. Sergio was one of 10 injured that night. Several people had warned Couch he was too drunk to drive, but he took the wheel anyway. Cynthia Zaguirre is now in our newsroom in Dallas. Oh, Cynthia, this is an issue that touches so many people in North Texas. Actually, to the core in some cases, John, and all day today, North Texas is going to be talking about Ethan Couch, the, de the jail time that he has served, uh, his strict probation ahead. But at the end of the day, this case is about drunk driving and tonight I am here with two women deeply affected by people who chose to drink and drive. Joining me are Gwen Edwards and Kim Acosta. Acosta. Gwen, we're going to begin with you. Tell us who you lost and how you lost him. I lost my son. He was 22, he turned 22 years old, November the 9th, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 2010 and he was killed on November the 17th. To, to a drunk driver. Um, it's been eight years, going on eight years, and it's really hard. Kim, tell us about your loss and how he was killed by a drunk driver. I lost my brother, Woody. He's my only brother, and uh, he was killed on Christmas Eve of 2010 while he was crossing the street. 
um, walking to the grocery store. It was a very violent way, the way he died. Uh, yes, he was uh, crossing the, um, the southbound, um, sorry, the northbound lanes of Beach Street and a 21-year-old driver driving at about 40 to 50 miles an hour uh, came through and hit him and he flew up onto the hood through the windshield and then back out into the roadway. And it was you who had to call his daughter? I had to make one of the hardest phone calls of my life. Um, I had to call my then 20-year-old niece, Stephanie, on Christmas morning and let her know that her father had been killed. So much pain. I can't imagine the hurt. It must be incomprehensible. Let's talk about your reaction to Ethan Couch's release from jail today, Gwen. I was angry, and I'm still angry because it's a decision that you can make and not be behind the wheel of a car. My anger is more because uh, he'll be leading up to his 21st birthday. And these families that he's impacted by driving drunk, they're not able to have their loved ones for their birthdays or any of the holidays. So I think it's just a slap in the family's face that he's released. Um, it's a slap in the family's face that he received probation for killing and injuring so many people, so many loved ones, because he not only took these people from their loved ones, he took them from society. So much emotion. Kim, I ask you the same question. When you watched coverage of Ethan walking out of the jail today and into that Tesla, what did you think? As a victim family, it's very frustrating um, to see that you know these people go forward. They'll be with their families, like yes. Gwen was saying, on holidays and occasions. and. We don't have our loved ones. We celebrated Easter. My brother wasn't at the table with us for Easter, or you know, his children are going through growing up and going through things. And um, it's you know, it's it's sad to say, but we have to make some changes. We have to change the system. On that note, is it possible for someone like Ethan Couch to learn his lesson and truly be rehabilitated? I don't believe. I would hope so. Uh, I, pr I do pray for him, even though I have anger, but I don't think he will because of what he has done before he's had that second. To me, this is his third opportunity because he's had chances, and I don't think he, he is. There's a lot of emotion here, Gwen. Is there anything you'd like to say to Ethan directly to the camera? Because there, he might be watching. I would hope that you've learned something. I doubt it very seriously. I would hope that you, this would hap wouldn't happen to any family because this is devastating. For you to have been released today before your 21st birthday, you will be at home with your dad or your mom or your friends, but these families have to be victimized because of you being released today. Kim? I, I feel like the choice is yours. You have the opportunity and you're in control, so you need to make that choice and it's all on you. We talk about the grief. There's a lot of anger in your voice. So my next question is one that I want you to think about, not necessarily answer right away, but I want you to think about this, and then I want your answer. Have you forgiven the man who killed your son? Have you forgiven the woman who killed your brother? Don't answer yet. This conversation is going to continue on our Facebook page. Just search WFAA. We're going to talk about this, and we're going to talk about so much more that we haven't been able to cover here in this short time period. John, back to you. Thank you. Uh, Still ahead, could you forgive someone who took your best friend? Our coverage continues next at Wedgwood Baptist Church. Two pastors and their journey to find mercy. In the case of Ethan Couch, finding the strength to forgive might be especially difficult. News 8's Bradley Blackburn is with two faith leaders with insight on what it truly means to forgive. Bradley? John, we are in a place that is built on forgiveness in the sanctuary of Wedgwood Baptist in Fort Worth. This is, of course, the place where seven people were killed by a gunman in 1999. Pastor Al Meredith is with us, and so is Tim Williams. Tim knew one of the victims who was killed here at Wedgwood, and he also knew one of Ethan Couch's victims. His best friend, Brian Jennings, was killed in that Father's Day crash. We have asked them both here to speak to us about forgiveness. And Tim, let me begin with you. You, you know, you took the extraordinary step of asking to meet Ethan Couch in his jail, even befriending him. What is it like today to see him walk free? Well, it is tough to see him out right now, 
but I know that that was the decision the judges made. And so I've accepted that and, and do hope that he continues moving forward. Mm -hmm. Pastor Meredith, Ethan Couch is free now, of course, but everywhere he goes, he will find people who know his story and judge him. What do you say to members of the public uh, about forgiving someone they've never met? Well, if you're a Christ follower, forgiveness is not a choice. It's, it's a commandment. Uh, it's not a feeling. It's important to know what forgiveness is not. It's not excusing what he's done. It's not forgetting about the people who paid with their lives. But forgiveness is more important to the forgiver than the forgivee. If they choose not to, they're insisting on drinking the poison they may have intended for their worst enemy. For their own sakes, choose to forgive. Tim, one of the things about Couch's case that sticks with people is his attitude throughout this whole ordeal, his apparent lack of remorse uh, over four deaths. You have met him in person. How do you think he has reckoned with his actions? Do you think he's forgiven himself? He, he has forgiven himself because that seemed to be one of the first steps to help him begin to own what he did, but also begin to receive forgiveness. So I've seen that in him. Has that been a journey for him? It's been a pretty long journey. It's been an uncomfortable journey for myself and I believe for him also. Let me ask you both, um, finally, what, why is it difficult for us to forgive and, and why is it, uh, why does for, how does forgiveness help the person who grants it? Well, it's tough to forgive because we're born with an innate sense of justice. Yeah. Uh, how many times as a three and four year old you said, but it's not fair. Of course, your mother said, whoever told you things were fair. But there's just that insistence of karma or whatever you want to call it, cosmic sense of justice that you get what you deserve. No such thing as a free lunch. And uh, when you see someone that's done terrible things, you would think, man, he deserves terrible punishment in this case. Uh, it hasn't been terrible enough for most of the public. Tim? I agree with that. It's just not natural to just, just give forgiveness because we have felt so hurt. And so it's just something you have to really process through and make the decision that I'm going to forgive. It's right and I've got to move forward. And Tim, have you forgiven Ethan? I have. Um, it was difficult and, and I worked through that before I met him. All right. Well, Tim Williams, Pastor Al Meredith, thank you for your time and for your thoughts on forgiveness, on the power of forgiveness, something for us all to keep in our minds and hearts as we watch this news today. John? All right. Thanks a lot, Bradley. The Ethan Couch case has so many layers. You can watch some of the stories that we've covered, watch raw video of his release from jail, and learn more about the victims on WFAA.com.